Um, soy Pablo Galindo, I'm uh, a C Python core dev, a steering council, and release manager of 310 and 311. Uh, but today I am going to bring you a collection of uh, weird stuff from C Python. Uh, you may think, oh, right, this is the kind of talk when, like, you know, you saw us weird stuff and bugs that you suffer, and we will learn a lot. Yeah, it's true except the last part. Like, it's just, it's just about like me whining for like half an hour. <laughs> Uh, but uh, hopefully, like there is some, I try to put some conclusions after the, every bug so we can learn something. But uh, ideally, this serves not only as a, you know, interesting collection of like weird stuff that can happen and how uh, C is a really bad language, um, but also like give you some insight into um, what is to contribute to C Python and why sometimes we take like uh, three weeks to solve like a small bug, right? Awesome. So let's start with one of my favorite ones. Uh, this is called like exclusive syntax errors. So this happened when uh, we were implementing the new cool f strings in Python uh, 3.12. And uh, the problem happened when uh, you run this code. And then you see, like, well, that, that sounds like, OK, it's, it's an easy code. You should like, you know, get this working quietly in the project. So we did, actually. And um, you know, this work on my machine. And after the bug, you will see that it works on my machine. It's less an excuse, more than a miracle. But like, you know, you will see. Um, so it turns out that when we submit the PR and we run it in the CI, uh, only on some machines, we found this error. So some, it was a syntax error that only happened on certain architectures. Um, uh, quite weird, and it's complaining basically that a, a closing quote is not a, um, a curly braces. And then you say, ah, but Pablo, I know what you're thinking. Like, this is in release mode, right? Like, this is in the final version. C Python has a debug mode. So I should be able to just go, uh, like, you know, run this thing on the back mode and get a much better error, right? Okay, this is the error that you get in the back mode. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, you can imagine uh, how people feel here. Um, if, if, if you find this like already like you know discouraging enough, um, the problem is like you say, oh, okay, well, okay, this is kind of weird, but like, I will try to reproduce this this shenanigans. Uh, okay, so this only reproduces on ARM 64. So for like if you have an, like an M1 laptop, you can like more or less have a Docker container. But at the time, the only thing that we have is this is Raspberry Pi, and like this error only happened on Raspberry Pis. It's the syntax error that only happens in Raspberry Pis. Quite bad. Um, so let's 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 explain what what's going on. So in tokenizer, at some point, like you know, the part that basically grabs the source code and transforms it into tokens, so it can give it to the parser. There is this little code uh, that basically saying get token. And this function is supposed to basically like, you know, read your text and return the next token. And it places this on this char uh, variable called token. And if you go basically to get token, it's very easy. It's uh, like, uh, you know, 2,000 line function. <laughs> but at some point it says this, oh, if there is an error, I will return minus one. And what is the problem? Ah, we need to be like lawyers and like go to the sacred C11 standard. And the C11 standard is fantastic because it says, well, you know, like uh, the, the, the type of char sometimes is like unsigning, sometimes it's in, sometimes I don't know, like it's up to the compiler. Haha, <laughs> good luck. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah. So what was happening basically is like in, in ARM um, 64, uh, it turns out that uh, charts are unsigned only on that. So when you were returning minus one as an error, it magically transformed that into 255. Uh, so when this call was executed and you stored that uh, basically on the um, on the on the token, uh, then what was happening is that the token, an error token, basically transformed itself into 255, which is a valid token, which is curly brace close. And the tokenizer was saying, like, what is this curly brace close? Like, what is going on? And illegal. So syntax error. Uh, and uh, that was the that was the reason. Obviously, like, if you run into uh, the back mode, we have like a bunch of asserts around, so you get the other lovely error. And after like you know one week of like running this code quite a lot of times. Uh, the fix is very easy. You just change that to that. Very easy. Yeah? Now it's an integer. Now it works on all architectures. OK, so what are the conclusions of this small bug? Uh, but it's only one, like uh, avoid Z. It's, it's really bad. <laughs> <laughs> there are no more conclusions. <laughs> no more conclusions. Good luck. Uh, especially avoid Z in Raspberry Pi. Uh, extremely dangerous. OK, let me show you this other one. This one is, is very cool. So, um, so in Python 3.11, we have this like cool, like you know, error messages, and now like it's, it's fantastic. It tells you where the message is. Like, I, I wonder who did that. Like, fantastic. Um, so, so uh, we receive after the change, uh, we receive this interesting error. So, someone complained. 
that if you run this code, so basically like, uh, you know, like it doesn't matter what this is, but like if you raise this runtime error over there, and then you measure how much time this code tends to run, basically you are catching it, so raising it and catching it, and then you compare this with another version of this in which you put like a lot of like lines. So like imagine just a lot more lines. So if the syntax error is raised on line 10,000 compare if you raise the syntax error, uh, sorry, the runtime error on line one. So this code is much, much, much smaller. So someone actually made some experiments there, uh, sorry, much slower. So someone made some experiments there and compare like how much time does it take to uh, basically raise uh, an exception depending on the line when you raise the exception and they give us this lovely plot. Uh, <laughs> the technical term is no bueno. <laughs> So yeah, um, that was kind of bad. Uh, so we have this lovely report and um, we have to fix it. So let me explain what is basically going on here. So this is the PR when we fix it. So how we fix it? Well, it turns out that, uh, you know, if you basically like have a function and then you raise an exception, uh, and the, the except, like the, the, if you catch it, basically the exception has an attribute, this dumber trace back over there. Uh, here, and that down the traceback has an attribute that is called uh, TB line no, like, you know, traceback line number, and it tells you three, so that's the way we can know when the exception is happening, and then the traceback machinery or your own code can basically, like, print that. Um, the, the thing is that uh, the way this, this number is basically computed uh, is that um, we, we know the, the instruction number where the problem happened, and then we need to translate that instruction number to a line number, right? So, like, we, we, we need to do this translation. Um, unfortunately, like having a, like a, a map of every possible instruction number in a code object to the line number is quite long. Like if you can imagine, uh, most instructions will have, like there is going to be a bunch of instructions that probably will happen on the same line. So you are going to have things like instruction one happens in line one, instruction two in line one, instruction three in line one. So storing that is quite expensive. Like not, we don't like that. So something that we did, especially now that you, we store like also like all this information in code objects because we need to tell exactly where it happened. So that what we do basically is to store this um, in, a, in a compressed fashion. So basically, if you imagine this, uh, you have uh, the start instruction and the end instruction. So for instance, for instruction zero to instruction six, uh, then that is line one. So instead of say, like saying zero, one, 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 two, one, we just say from zero to six is line one. And then from six to 50, that is line two, and et cetera, right? So, so this is still already good because we don't need to repeat every single instruction and every single line. But what we do here is that we uh, compress this even further. Um, and basically, like what we do is that we store only the deltas. So we store both the deltas in the line, uh, in the instruction offsets and in the lines. So here it says from zero to six, you need to add plus one to the delta. So in this case, because the delta starts at zero is one. And then it says uh, until uh, like, uh, if you add 45, uh, sorry, 44 uh, to the instruction offset, then you add one extra to the line delta. So that the way basically you can reconstruct adding these numbers, um, what is the line number and the instruction. Uh, here uh, we have another problem because this is compressing specific specific line uh, types in C, and that 200 is too big for the thing that we use, so we need to like break it apart in even more lines, so this is like even more complicated. There is like a, basically a, like a pseudo code that you can, I can show you just how to reconstruct this thing, but the most important thing for you to understand is not how to reconstruct it, is that there is a loop there. So basically, if you want to know, and this is the whole key of this problem, if you want to know the line that is associated with instruction 10,000, you need to compute all of the previous ones, right? So you cannot just have it. You need to say, oh, what is like the line for uh, instruction zero? And then you keep later it in over the table, and then you will know at the end of the iteration what is the instruction from line 10,000. So this is the problem that was happening, because we always compute this number and attach it to tracebacks. If you raise the exception in line 10,000, we need to go to this table and compute all of the different lines uh, until we have the one that we want, and then we stick it into the traceback object, and doing this thing all the time uh, is wasteful. Why is wasteful? Well, because if you think about it, you only need the, the line number when you actually want to show where the problem is, and you only show where the problem is when nobody is catching the exception. But here we're computing this thing all the time, even if people are like catching the exception and doing something else. So the fix that we did is that basically make this lazy, because I mean, we, we need to do this anyway, it's how people handle the bug expressions in other languages as well, but we did this lazy. So in Python code, basically the idea is to have a, like a property or something on the traceback object, obviously this is in C, the illegal language, but uh, like this is like a, just an idea. So the idea is that instead of like, you know, pre-computing this thing every single time we create a traceback object, we have like a, a descriptor, a property that, um, 
but that's this lazy only when you access it. So the idea is that only when code actually needs this line number, then you actually compute it. Um, it looks a bit more ugly in C, like so. So this this is the way you you will do this in C. But the important part here is that um, like when you uh, want to calculate uh, the descriptor, this is the way you declare a descriptor in C, and then you call this other function, and that actually calls the C code for calculating the address line, which is this algorithm. Um, so funny enough, uh, this is not the first time we have this problem uh, in Python three point Eight, I think, uh, or 3.7, uh, we have a funny one as well. Um, so if you look at this, uh, it's a similar one related to this. So if you look at this particular, um, this comprehension, uh, and then you look at the call objects, uh, the, sorry, the bytecode here, you have a bunch of bytecodes here, you don't need to understand what it means, but like, uh, because this is a loop basically with a conditional inside, there is a bunch of jumps, because the jumps will need to say, oh, go to the next iteration of the loop, uh, if the element is false, so because there is a conditional over here, right, that is checking if, if the element is true or false, so you have two jumps, one if the element is false, and the other is if it's true, and then you need to jump. So there is like two jumps here, uh, this pop jump is false, and then there is this jump absolute. And the good thing is that these two uh, jump to the start of the iteration. So for instance, if you go here, it tells you to line to line four, so you line to line four, and then you restart the loop of the least comprehension, and you arrive to this jump absolute, you also line to line four, so you start again. So both jumps are just one jump. But then, if you just create a new line <laughs> in the least comprehension, <laughs> uh, then, oh no, something happened. So uh, the, this one now jumps to line four, the same as before, but look at this one. If the thing is false, instead of jumping directly to uh, the four iter in line four, it jumps to line 16, which is this jump absolute, and then it jumps to line four. So instead of one jump, it's two of them. You will say, why, well, I mean, this is not a big deal. Well, I mean, you have a big least comprehension, maybe it is. Um, but think about it. What piece of software really likes to put like things in different lines? Black. Black really likes to do that. So you know, Black was the first code unoptimizer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Black, they call an optimizer. Yes, yes. So um, fantastic formatting considered harmful. Um, so we, we fixed this because like Wukas was freaking out uh, for because it was a PR problem, uh, but, but uh, you know a PR not like pull request like you know public relationships uh, and uh, we we fixed it. So now a black is just slightly unoptimizing, but I won't tell you where. Um, so conclusions, conclusions, uh, important. Uh, so C, C Python will always buy you back. Like it doesn't matter. Like you you create these like nice like error messages, it will always have like some cool surprises. Um, also, like calculating line numbers is linear. That's kind of important. It's not going away. It's just that now it's lazy. But if you, for instance, are calculating line numbers constantly because, like, I don't know, you have a tool that does this, uh, you need to know that it's linear. And uh, you have a file that have like I don't know 10,000 lines, so you need to calculate all of the rest first. So I suppose the conclusion is don't have files that have 10,000 lines. Uh, you know, it's better just to have like little files. And then the other is like uh, measuring side effects is kind of complicated, because especially when you have like some code base as big as C Python, uh, because like if you think about it, we in this case what trigger all these problems is that we added this code to like have nice uh, traceback formatting, and the rest of the code was the same. Like uh, the code that was sticking the line numbers in the traceback objects was unchanged. That was always there. It's just that now uh, all of these things put together trigger this like, lazy, like sorry this not lazy resolution, and now something that used to be like all one like it used to be now and now it's now it's um, the, the, the funny thing here is like uh, if you have as many users as C Python will have, uh, people will find all your bugs, which is like both terrifying and cool because like you know at least you know like all the ways you um, you know you screw up, which uh, I don't know maybe it's not great for your mental health, but like it's good for the community. Awesome. So next bug. Uh, this this is very interesting. So the next bug is that Python 3.6 sec faults only after 2020. Uh, <laughs> Wow. Um, so so let, let's, let, let's look how what happened. So um, this happened when I was working at my company. Um, uh, you know, why we execute Python 3.6? It's like vintage Python, you know? Like, we, we have all Pythons, but people can do whatever they want. Um, so someone was complaining that, you know, after 2020, uh, if you execute like like this setup.py, uh, you know, nothing super complicated here, uh, just Python sec fault. Uh, just, just, just sec faults. So we, we just investigated what was going on in the sec faults. So we, we went and analyzed, analyzed the whole thing. And then we find out that basically this was happening when CPython imports C types. And in C types, there is this function that is called just by importing it, which is creating this like C type function type lambda for some unknown reason. We, we don't judge. Like we just, you know, we, we just read code. Uh, it's our job. 
Uh, and then, like, uh, you know, when, when it's calling this function, uh, it's like faulting. And if you go down and then say, okay, we need to go into the C code and see what's happening, uh, it's basically like faulting in this assembly instruction. And this MOBAPS, which stands for Move Align Pack Single Precision Floating Point Value, because, like, why not? Uh, and uh, by the way, uh, I have an I have a, a, a ongoing thing that is like uh, um, I, in every single talk that I have been in for the past three years, I always saw assembly code at PyCon, so check. I, I, I managed to do it again. Uh, so yes, it's, it's basically like faulting in this mob apps instruction. Uh, so so why, why is that? Well, it turns out that um, this code basically, this is the code that, that generates that instruction. Uh, and the important thing here is not what it's doing here, is that at the end it's assigning two pointers. So this self callable and self funk. And uh, that mob apps instruction is a vectorized instruction. So, so uh, the, the compiler says, wow, I can assign these two pointers at once, technology. Um, and, uh, but there is a kind of a problem, because like, you know, it's assigning problems to a struct, right, like this self. So that struct looks like this. Uh, so why is it important? Well, it's important because the, the two pointers that are assigning is this two, two at, the, at the end, but the thing that is before that is this union. And this union has this long double. So these forces, I mean, I can, you, can, you, can, you, you must believe me here unless you know uh, the, like, the legal language, <laughs> that these forces, these things to have an alignment on 16 bytes. Uh, like that, that is what the compiler will think. Basically, like the compiler thinks that both pointers uh, must be aligned to 16 because the, the union must be 16 aligned. Uh, but if you check that, it, it's not aligned to 16 bytes. Like that, that is false. And if you go to the, to the basically the uh, CPU architecture for the MOAPS instruction, which is a long test that you don't need to read, it says that when you generate a MOAPS instruction, the operands need to be aligned to 16 bytes. And if you fail, well, that's the problem, and you get this nasty seg fault. Uh, so what is the problem? Like, why this is not aligned to 16 bytes? Is this a compiler bug? Well, it's not a compiler bug. It's a CPython bug, because, like, obviously, it would be very cool to just blame the compiler. Um, so uh, the problem is that in PyMalloc, we are allocating a space for, like, this struct over here. So this struct is allocated with the Python allocator. And the Python allocator, like, it just handles memory manually. Uh, and when it's handling memory manually, it, it decides to align things to different things. In particular, there is a, a, is a constant in the code that set, tells basically PyMalloc what to align the code to. So the fix is was very easy. It's just changing that A to 16, and voila, it works. So, but then the question is like, why it was only happening after 2020? Well, the reason is because uh, after 2020, GCC, uh, the compiler that was generated to create this code, upgraded itself, and now it's powerful enough to generate these vectorized instructions, except that you know, it starts facing these bugs in CPython, and then it crashes. Uh, so that's, that's, the, that's the surprise of why it's like after 2020. So conclusions, uh, um, you know, AVX instructions will hurt you. Like, it's not good. Like, assigning two things at once is, is not worth it. Um, the other interesting thing is that optimizations normally will invalidate your assumptions. And this is like, a, you know, it's a tension between compiler like, that try to be faster and your code that is probably incorrect. So like, normally it's very common, especially for compiled languages, that uh, code that is incorrect will be surfaced when the compiler starts to activate weird uh, optimizations. So if you're do, like dealing with uh, programs done in C, you need to be ready to just go down and like, you know, like, like look around into, into uh, the code that is being generated and just check if that is happening correctly, especially if you're uh, implementing memory allocators. And the other thing that is quite important is that you need to be prepared to read the specification. In this case, like, I just copied you the paragraph, but that paragraph was in basically like a book of like six million pages, and then you need to look for it, right? Uh, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it's not that simple. Okay, another one. Uh, so this is interesting. So this is this sometimes called objects become frozen sets. So we have this like lovely error report, basically uh, titled weird test failures related to tracebacks. Because obviously, you know, that's it. And uh, basically, someone was complaining that this is the traceback, that uh, if they were receiving this error called frozen set object has no attribute F code. So this is like a code object that magically became a frozen set. Um, if, if you don't believe that this is something that people will be like, uh, you know, atonish, uh, the, the brand, which is the person who was checking this bug, basically was checking, sorry, he did first, was really checking like how, how, how this happened. And not only that, like, if, like it only happens for code objects, it also happens for like other stuff, so for, for frames. So mysteriously, like a bunch of Python objects would become in frozen sets. Um, quite a right. Uh, so this is the reproducer. Um, I don't need you to like understand anything here. I just need to, you to be afraid of this. Uh, so so you, you can just say like, 
wow, Pablo, the real question is like, why this is actually even working? <laughs> but yes, uh, you create like this, this like a GC loop, and then you like basically create a, like open a file that you don't close, which creates a warning, and then you like make the GC collect this. It was basically crashing. The reason this is crashing is because before Python 3.11, we used to have one frame object, like one, and it's a Python object, and every time we create these frame objects, uh, sorry, a new frames, we create one of these. But after Python 3.11, we optimize this to have two of these guys. So uh, this is the previous one, all of that in a like gigantic extract, and right now we have two of these, like the Python object and one called PyInterpret frame. If you think these are bad names, well, they are, but like, you know. Uh, so the idea is that now we create the second one, which is more optimized and only in C, and only if we need to create like Python objects because someone asked for it or a traceback happens, or you know, there is a generator, for instance, we create the one on the left. But there is a dependency between the two. Like one will own, like the, the one on the left, if it's created, will own the one on the right, and will only delete it once that is created. So before, before we have that big chunk, now we have one big, smaller chunk, it's still big, and a smaller chunk for the Python object. So basically two different ones. And then the idea is that when you get a frame, uh, there is like a, a, a bunch of checks, but uh, you are calling this by, by frame get frame object. And uh, what happens here is that the fix for this is basically calling this co thing called by frame is incomplete. So what is an incomplete frame? So the problem that was happening here is that uh, when, when you are creating these GC objects and whatnot, there was like another uh, like object being created in a generator, and then it's creating two of the Python object frames that are pointing to the same C frame, and all of them are fighting for ownership. And, and the problem is like one of them actually deletes the frame while the other one still has a pointer to it, which frees the memory, and and then the allocator says, well, it would be a pity if I just grab this memory that now is free and I put a frozen set of all things. Um, and somehow that goes through all C Python without crashing until it shows you this beautiful error. What, what, a, what, a, what a ride. Uh, interestingly, like, if you check like how we uh, like you know decide if a frame is incomplete or not, it's actually like all related to generators, but it's not super complicated. The idea is that there is a way to check it, and, and it's just uh, it, the, the, the semantics of this keep changing. So conclusions of this, uh, frames are now kind of hard. If you read the code in C Python, you, you will be scared. Uh, it's getting a bit better, but like you know, all this ownership is quite complicated. Uh, the other interesting thing that happens quite a lot in C Python is that uh, when you have memory errors, then the, all hell goes loose, right? Because the allocator will put objects uh, in your uh, memory that you don't expect, and then you now need to deal with like what the hell is going on. Uh, so you can see all sorts of weird shit happening, like you know, code objects becoming frozen sets and whatnot. Uh, and the other thing is that using Python in the back mode is really good because like instead of having these frozen sets in the middle, it will add some special bytes to the allocator. So instead of like having weird uh, code that is working but it's like you don't understand what is going on, uh, it just crashes, which uh, believe me is better, <laughs> at least for the bugging. Okay, the last one that I'm going to show you uh, is, uh, is this cool one uh, called sometimes I see half initialized tuples. So that's kind of cool. So, uh, so basically the error was happening when someone was running some uh, SQLite uh, code. And this could like it was basically very easy. Chris had like a tuple of a bunch of elements, like it's up for a record, so he calls this pi tuple new. And then there is a, a lot of code basically fetching the elements for the uh, for the database, and then he calls this pi tuple set item to set the items in the tuple. And then it was just hard crashing. Um, so uh, a reproducer for this that doesn't use SQLite is all this code. Again, you don't need to understand anything. It's just uh, for looking smart and complicated. But the idea here is that. Um, you can make this, uh, this, this code trigger uh, by basically triggering the GC in the middle of a, a tuple bit being basically created. So here you have a generator, so you are yielding objects, and then you call tuple over your generator. So what's happening here is that the tuple is receiving the items, and the, as more items are available, it resizes itself, uh, becoming bigger and bigger. But if you call GC get reference over like uh, the, the object that you are yielding, you can see this tuple while it's being filled like in the middle of it. It's a bit junky, and you can basically say, well, the surprising thing here is that why is this actually not crashing? But um, you know, uh, in, in, in three times it was not crashing. So if you actually print that, you will see that uh, C Python will print the double, and it will show you a bunch of nulls. Like this is actually like like uh, without crashing, so it will show you that the tuple is incomplete. So it has in this case one object at the start, but all of the other points are null. Uh, this is kind of okay until the actual resizing happens, and then you will get like this bad argument to internal function in the uh, tuple object that C, because like when when it sees all those nodes in the middle of it, it doesn't expect them, and then it blows up. Um, so that that is the problem. So okay, so what is the problem here? The problem here is that this pi tuple new creates a tuple, an empty tuple with a bunch of nodes, and immediately activates the garbage collector over it. 
And the problem is that if you are trying to like create a bunch of objects to put it in the tuple, well, what happens is that the garbage collector can run at that point, and then it will be able to inspect the tuple mid-creation. And like when the tuple is half created, the garbage collector just blows up. Uh, so that is kind of a problem. And it can also happen in many other ways. So for instance, this is another, like if you check it, the PyTuple new, the call here, you will see that uh, it basically allocates the tuple over here and then immediately calls PyObject digit track even if the tuple is full of nulls and mid-initialization. Uh, this happens f by many other ways. For instance, Judy here, uh, he doesn't remember uh, apparently, but uh, I checked with him, he fixed a bug here that was the same problem except that not with tuples, but with one of the uh, types in the Hamty code because what happens is that you were creating an object with, without initializing a bunch of fields and tracking the GC immediately. So which means that when you try to initialize the fields, the GC is already seeing uh, the object mid-creation, and when it tries to visit it, it blows up. Um, so I, I don't blame Judith for not remembering, it's quite traumatic. Uh, so you know, it, here's what it happened. Basically, you were like allocating a new GC object, and then you forget to like allocate a bunch of things, and then you track the GC. So anything that you do after this is going to be able to see the, the object missing initialization. So the, the fix basically is initialize those fields over there, and then when the uh, garbage collector tries to access those fields, it's going to see that they are null, so it's not going to do anything with that. This is quite a problem, and the pattern basically is calling anything that allocates the GC and then trying to do a bunch of things. And this is still a bug that is open. Like, if you see this, this is Victor Stinner trying to fix it in six million ways, and, and you know, it's not, it's not working. <laughs> so this is still an open problem. Uh, here is like Victor Stinner trying to explain the whole problem and people crying around. Uh, so it, it's kind of hard. So the way we basically fix this is because uh, in CPython, the garbage collector is only triggering when you allocate an object. This used to be the case for Python 3.11 and before. So this is the call here for py, uh, py object DC alloc. So there is a bunch of like is the if uh, the conditional, the bigger conditional in the planet. But basically what it's checking is like, oh, I will create an object and it will create, I will check in the GC if I have enough objects to run and then I will call this collect generations which basically runs the GC. Uh, so in Python 3.12, we changed this uh, to basically instead of running the GC immediately, we scale the GC over here. And instead of running it just in the creation of the object, we uh, wait for something called the eval breaker. So the eval breaker basically is, is a code. Uh, so this is the schedule code. It basically says a bunch of flags of the, uh, in the serial code. And then the eval breaker basically is some code that runs in the middle of the evaluator loop, and it checks for a bunch of things. So for now, it checks also for garbage collector, but before it was checking basically for request to drop the gill, uh, like I've seen exceptions, pending calls, and signal handling. So basically, it's executing a bunch of instructions, and from time to time, it decides to say, oh, I'm going to check for a bunch of things, and this is a very safe place to actually run uh, like the GC because like every, the world is saying there is no half initialized objects, and you can actually like go and, and check. Okay, so I'm a bit um, over time, so I'm going to go to the, uh, the conclusions here. It's a lot of like we are back over here, but uh, let me jump to the end. Wow. Okay, conclusions. So uh, users are quite hard, uh, you know, like because they will find all your bugs. Uh, every observable behavior basically will be rely upon our users uh, because like all of these like bugs and things like uh, is basically being triggered by code. Uh, that was using, uh, working before, and if you change the assumptions, it will basically break. And uh, all XKCD comments will eventually become a reality, <laughs> even if, uh, if you see there. So, okay, so what we have learned? We have learned that CPython always buys you back, so you need to be prepared to, like, you know, uh, suffer a bit. Uh, like, uh, like, errors can be quite wild, so, like, most of the time, you will see, like, error reports, and you will say, there is no way, but yes, it will happen. Uh, and then, you know, there is always an answer. So, like, if you spend, like, enough months, like, fighting the issue, and you, you will eventually find it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's everything. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoy the talk.